Human contact is very important in building and maintaining family love, closeness, and tenderness. Close human interaction, including age and sex-appropriate physical contact, is important in maintaining good mental and physical health. In practical terms, the laying on of hands is the first doctrine to be experienced by mankind immediately after being born. Mothers and others normally hold and cuddle the newborn. When I was director for children's issues at the U.S. Department of State some years ago, I read a study where it was noted that orphan babies in South Korea survived at a much higher rate than orphans in Romania. But both countries had similar economic situations and standards for infant orphan care. So what made the difference? The difference in survival rates seemed to be the fact that the South Korean nurses picked up and held the babies, while the Romanian nurses normally just changed the babies, fed them, but didn't pick them up and left the infants generally alone in the crib. This study showed that human care, touch, embracing others, really does make a positive difference in people's health. The laying on of hands is also, in a sense, the last doctrine we experience in this life as we lay dying. People nurse us, they help change our clothes, they hold our hand to comfort and reassure us at that time. Now clearly physical contact and hugs must be appropriate to the sex, age, and relationship of the parties. Men especially need to be careful in any physical contact with the opposite sex that the contact is appropriate and wanted. We need to be sensitive also to cultural differences and personal preferences. Some people will not want to hug others, some will only want to shake hands. So we must be careful to avoid any appearance of impropriety. With the onset of COVID, our civil leaders recommended or even imposed separation of people, even family members from each other. A RAND University of Southern California study published in June 2021 as a working paper of the US National Bureau for Economic Research showed that shelter in place orders also known as lockdowns, actually increase the number of COVID infections leading to more deaths. What helps increase survivability in such an epidemic? John Berry, in his definitive work on the 1918 Spanish influenza epidemic entitled The Great Influenza, I have a copy here, uh, he noted on page 408 that a door-to-door -door survey of several cities after the flu had subsided indicated that those who went to bed the earliest, that those who stayed there the longest and had the best nursing care, survived at the highest rates. So it seems that those who had the close comforting touch and care of another human being survived better while those who were alone without that caring touch did worse. When our society wishes to punish someone, very often the offender is put into prison and separated from most human contact. In extreme cases, solitary confinement is used. Solitary confinement tends to break the spirit and produce more docile behavior. Our society has gone through a punishing time. Separation caused by government efforts to control COVID has led to more suicides, depression, and great economic harm, which also affects the health of those who lost jobs. Now, as God's people, we teach that healthy people should, in fact, must assemble and worship with singing and praise on God's Sabbath day. We know we need to be together. The doctrine of laying on of hands, which helps strengthen close bonds of brotherhood and friendship, helps us better understand the mind of God. God uses this doctrine to build his church, to benefit his people, and to heal the sick. Let's go back to Isaiah 64. Isaiah chapter 64, a very famous scripture. Isaiah 64 and verse eight. But now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are potter, and all we are the work of your hand. Yes, God chose and called each of us individually. 
We are under his authority, his government. In that sense, God has laid his hand on all of us to mold us, to shape us, to bless us, to help us become the kind of loving sons and daughters that God wants us to become. Back in Hebrews chapter 6, there is a list of basic doctrines in the church of God. And again, this list is not uh, exhaustive. For instance, it doesn't list the doctrine of the kingdom of God. But these, verse, these uh, doctrines listed here are basic and foundational, and we do need to go over them from time to time. Hebrews chapter 6, I'll start in verse 1. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. And perfection is our goal. We want to try our very best to avoid mistakes, to avoid saying wrong things, to avoid hurting others, and to positively build up and encourage and help others. Let's go into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, that's one, of faith toward God, living faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, again, how many are there? Of laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment, and this we will do if God permits. The title for today's sermon is very simple, The Doctrine of Laying on of Hands. We will show today that this doctrine, its uses include divine healing, the receipt of God's Spirit, ordination to office in the church, the giving or passing or conferring of blessings. It does symbolize submission to the government of God. And lastly, setting apart a sacrifice or designating a guilty party. Let's go first to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. There are so many examples of miracles and of healings in the, in the scriptures. We'll just be covering a few. And you should also remember that the Gospel of Mark, while it's named after Mark, and apparently he's the one that wrote it, he wrote it apparently under the influence, the guidance of the Apostle Peter. So what we're seeing here is basically Peter's recollection of the miracles and the work of Jesus Christ that Mark wrote down. Mark chapter 5, we can start in verse 22. Behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. So again, people knew about the laying on of hands. They understood that. They wanted Jesus to come lay on hands. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. But something happened in the meantime. A certain woman, verse 25, had a flow of blood for 12 years and suffered many things from many doctors or physicians. She spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And it's interesting, if you look at the parallel verses of Luke 8, 44 and Matthew 9, 20, we see that she basically touched the tassel of Jesus' garment, the embroidered hem of his garment. So Jesus did wear tassels at the time. So she touched him, or touched his clothes. And verse 29, immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up. She felt in her body she was healed. Now, I'll just give you a preview. This may be a precursor to the doctrine of anointed clause of Acts 19. And we'll look at that verse a little bit later. Because she basically, as far as we can tell, just touched the tassel or the hem of his garment. So she was healed. And you can read the rest of that. Uh, but then 35, while he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? And Jesus said, don't be afraid, just believe. And so Peter, James, and John, the brother James, went with them. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue. They saw the tumult, those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. Jesus taught over and over again that death in this life is like a sleep from which all human beings will one day be raised in the resurrection. Well, they ridiculed him, verse 40, but 
when he had put them all outside, he took the father and mother of the child and those who were with him, including Peter, and entered where the child was lying. He took the child by the hand. So again, he took her by the hand and said, Talita kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. And even though she was dead, she arose and walked, and she was 12 years of age. They were overcome with, overcome with great amazement. So we see Christ did lay hands. He laid, he raised the little girl by his hand. In chapter 6, verse 5, chapter 6, verse 5, he's in his own town of Nazareth, and he says, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, in his own house. He could do no mighty work there except he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. He marveled because of their unbelief. So again, Jesus was laying hands on for healing. Drop down to verse 12. The apostles that Jesus sent out two by two, he gave them power over unclean spirits. And so they went out, they preached the gospel, verse 12. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. So they anointed by putting a little bit of olive oil and laying on of hands, the olive oil being a symbol for God's Holy Spirit. Chapter 7, verse 32, 33, I won't turn there, but that's where the deaf man was healed by the touch of Jesus Christ. Go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And verse 40. It says, When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them, and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. So Jesus laid his hands on. This was understood that this was necessary for healing. People understood it. It was a matter of power. It was showing that Jesus had that power to lay on hands and to heal people. So we today, in the Church of God, we follow Jesus' example. The elders lay on hands and they, they anoint with oil for healing. Let's go back to James chapter 5. We see the basic chapter, basic verse there, James chapter 5, verse 13, I'll start. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. And again, if there's more than one elder in a congregation, you can have all the elders come. Sometimes there's only one, that's fine. But you can call for all the elders. The elders can come together. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. And again, we understand sometimes a sickness is caused by some kind of sin. Not always, not necessarily. Remember the situation of the man who was born blind? The disciples said, well, who sinned? You know, was it this, this guy or was it his parents? And Jesus said, no. Parents, the man, he didn't sin, but this situation arose to show the glory of God. So it, uh, sickness is not necessarily caused by sin, but sometimes, and so we do ask for forgiveness of sins. It says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another. Now, that doesn't mean confess, you know, like, oh, you know, I, I went out and I stole something, uh, you know, those kind of things. It's, it's basically talking about confess your your physical weaknesses, your sicknesses. And so that's why we do have prayer requests, because people are saying, look, I have this particular issue, please pray for me. And the prayer of faith will help save the sick. And so that's why we do that. We pray for one another that we might be healed. Now, sometimes the minister is unable to visit uh, the brethren who've called for uh, anointing. Let's go back to Acts 19, Acts 19. Sometimes it's a matter of distance. Um, you know, there can be other extenuating circumstances. And in that case, we have the example here of the Apostle Paul, Acts 19, verse 11. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. 
So again, we use this along with the fact of the woman touching the tassel or the hem of Jesus' garment to show that, yes, these pieces of cloth, they transmit the laying on of hands from the minister to the person uh, who needs that. And the church does follow this example. And again, we all know that Christ took our pains, our sicknesses upon him. So we don't take asking for anointing lightly, but please don't not avail yourself of this benefit that Christ paid for. Some people ask from time to time, how many times can you be anointed for the exact same condition? You, may, you might wait a couple weeks, you might wait a month or so. And I'll just refer you to 2 Corinthians 12, I won't read there, 2 Corinthians 12 verses 8 and 9, that Paul prayed three times for the same problem. Again, it's not clear what the problem was. Uh, God said that Paul could make it without being healed in this life of that particular issue. So it wasn't an issue of Paul's faith. And so, but it was three times for that. One more item here. Let's go back to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 20. We had a righteous king, King Hezekiah. And he was sick unto death. 2 Kings chapter 20. Verse 1, in those days Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Now that is terrible. I mean, God says to his prophet, you're going to die, you're not going to live. Did Hezekiah give up? No. He knew of God's mercy and so he beseeched God. He appealed directly to God. He turned his face to the wall and he prayed to God saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart. And I've done what was good in your sight. And he wept bitterly. Now remember at this time, Hezekiah had no heir. So there was a problem of the succession of the throne. The nation was under attack by the Assyrians under constant threat. It's not clear if this was before or, or after the great deliverance that, that God made. I think it was probably after the, the 180,000 men died in one night, and so the Assyrians went back there. But the Assyrian Empire was still a force to be reckoned with. And he didn't want the nation to be plunged into chaos by his death. Verse 4, it happened before Isaiah had gone into the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Return, and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people. Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. So God changed his mind. It's fascinating. Prayer, earnest, believing prayer, can lead God to change his mind on something as important as this. So he told him, you know, in three years, or in a third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord. I'll add to your days 15 years, and I'll defend this city. But then notice verse 7, that Isaiah said, take a lump of figs. So they took and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. Isn't that fascinating? Can't God heal without a lump of figs? Of course he can, because what's he doing here? The, the, the sign was that the shadow of the sun would go backward 10 degrees on the sundial. And, you know, people wonder, how did that happen? And one explanation is that the orbit of the earth maybe was pushed out a little bit. I mean, there, we don't quite know how that happened. But it's just interesting. God could do this marvelous thing with the sun. And still, Isaiah said, take a lump of figs. They laid it on the boil. So what does this tell us? It tells us that we are supposed to do for ourselves what we responsibly can do, what we understand that we should do for our own uh, healing. Okay, secondly, another use for the laying on of hands is receipt of the Holy Spirit. Now, many people in the world today think that they receive the Holy Spirit immediately upon water baptism. And of course, God is not limited. He could do so if he wanted to do so. For instance, there was the situation of Cornelius. The Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius and his household 
before they were even baptized. We don't have any record necessarily of Abraham being baptized or Isaac or Jacob, but they received God's spirit. They had God's spirit. But for the last about 2,000 years, God normally does things differently. He normally requires baptism first and then the laying on of hands by the ministry. Let's go to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. We have an interesting situation here. Acts 19 verse 1. It happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said, We have not so much heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. He said, Into what then were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied, about 12 men all together. So baptism, laying on of hands, goes together. And if we go back to Acts chapter 8, we see another situation. Acts chapter 8. I'll start in verse 14. And this was after um, Philip, who was a deacon, had gone preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God in Samaria. Verse 14, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So again, we have the example of the Bible is that you have repentance, you have faith in God, you're baptized, and then the hands are laid on by the ministry. It's clear that anyone can do the physical act of baptizing, but only ordained ministers have the authority to lay on hands for the receipt of God's Spirit. Let's go to the third use of the laying on of hands, ordination to office in the church. So go back to Numbers chapter 27. Numbers 27. And we have the situation, of course, Moses. God had <laughs> chosen Moses and even as a child, a baby, you know, protected his life in the Nile. And had led his life, and of course he had led him into the wilderness for 40 years. He was herding sheep, and then God called him, and, and God did remarkable miracles through Moses and Aaron. And as the time came, there had to be a transfer of authority for the nation, who would be the leader. Because God had told Moses, because of his sin and striking the rock twice, that he could not enter the promised land. Now why was that a sin? Because Jesus is the rock, and the rock is struck once for sin. The rock is not struck twice for sin. So it's like killing Christ again by this analogy. Christ is struck once, and we speak to the rock. We ask for forgiveness to Jesus Christ, our rock, for forgiveness of our sins. So because of that, Moses couldn't enter the promised land. So who is going to be the commander of the armies, humanly speaking, of Israel? Who is going to be the leader to lead them in? So this, they had to ordain Joshua. Numbers 27, I'll start in verse 18. The Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, with you, a man in whom is the Spirit. So again, Joshua already had the Spirit. Was he already baptized? You know, we can... We make the analogy of people going through the Red Sea as a baptism, but was he like physically, personally baptized in water? We don't have a record of that. But he had God's spirit, so it, and God said so. A man in whom is the spirit, and lay your hand upon him. Set him before Eliezer the priest and before all the congregation, and inaugurate him in their sight. And you shall give some of your authority to him that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. He shall stand before Eliezer the priest, who shall inquire before the Lord for him by the judgment of the Urim. At his word they shall go out, at his word they shall come in. 
he and all the children of Israel with him, all the congregation. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Joshua and sent him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation. And he laid his hands on him and inaugurated him or ordained him or commissioned him just as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. So it was a public ordination. It was a public inauguration. And the church follows this example today. When someone is ordained, it is done publicly. Let's go back to Acts chapter 6. You know the story in Acts 6 that there is a great increase in the number of disciples, but there is a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. Again, these were all Jewish people, but some were of the Greek culture. They were Jews, but they had more of the Greek culture and the Greek language because the widows were neglected in the daily distribution of food. And again, this is sort of introducing something that the ministry is supposed to be feeding the flock. That's what Jesus said, feed my sheep. And again, getting a little bit ahead of things, but you, the ministry has to feed the sheep with this word of God, but also as much as practical, make sure that the flocks, their physical needs are met. And so here we had the widows were being neglected. The 12 summoned the multitude of disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. It doesn't mean that it was bad, no, it, but someone has to do it. Therefore, the brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The saying pleased the whole multitude. And so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. Notice all the names were Greek names. They were Jewish people, but they had Greek names, so they were of that, that cultural background. They set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them, and they were ordained as deacons. They were ordained as deacons. So another situation is in Acts 13. Again, this was also done publicly before the brethren. They, they took nominations, if you will, and the apostles did the ordination. They, they put the blessing by the laying on of hands. In Acts 13, verse 1, Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So again, the, the standard practice in the church of God before ordination is to fast, to pray, and seek God's will in the ordination, and then lay hands. So it's just interesting here, you had five men who were fasting and praying together, um, and the Holy Spirit worked through that group of men to separate out two, and they laid hands on them as apostles. Back in 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4, Timothy was an evangelist, and we see in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, well, I'll start in verse 12, it says, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. And so we're giving attention to doctrine, a basic doctrine of the church today. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. So Timothy was ordained by the laying on of hands. He received, it seems, a special gift of God's spirit, special help, perhaps courage, perhaps other gifts, we don't know. But it was through the laying on of hands he received that extra power that he needed to do the job that God had him to do. So let's go now to the fourth use of the laying on of hands. And Genesis 48, Genesis 48, 
Again, this is a very famous passage. We'll just take a few parts of it. As you know, as the time came, Jacob had been in um, Egypt for a while. His family was all down there. Joseph was prime minister of Egypt. But the time came for Jacob. It was near for him to die. And he was blind, apparently couldn't see. So before Jacob died, Joseph wanted to have his sons who had been born in Egypt, Manasseh and Ephraim, to be blessed, to be blessed. So verse 9, Genesis 48, verse 9. Joseph said to his father, these are my sons, which God has given me in this place. And he said, please bring them to me and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age, so he could not see. And Joseph brought them near him and he kissed them and embraced them. So again, that family closeness, that physical contact, that human contact, he embraced them even though he couldn't see them. And he, Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought to see your face, but in fact, God has shown me your offspring. So Joseph brought them from beside his knees and bowed down with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim on his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. Then Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding the hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. Basically, he crossed his hands. And then he blessed Joseph, and he said, let my name be named upon them. Let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Well, now Joseph, I mean, was he keeping his eyes shut during the prayer? No, he was like, what's going on? He saw his father laid the right hand on Ephraim. It displeased him. So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on him. But the father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people. He also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So Israel was a prophet. He was conferring a blessing by the laying on of hands. And again, I'll just say, if this promise is not true, if this has not been fulfilled, then how can we believe the rest of the Bible and the promises that Jesus has forgiven our sins? So someone somewhere, some nation somewhere, has been the happy recipient of these blessings that God gave through the hands of Israel. God honored the living faith of the prophet Israel. Let's go to Deuteronomy 34. Blessings, extra help, come through the laying on of hands. Deuteronomy 34 and verse 9. Deuteronomy 34, verse 9. It says, Now Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the children of Israel heeded him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. So when someone is ordained, yes, we do ask for more of God's spirit, and we should also ask for more wisdom, more understanding. It is a great responsibility to be a leader of God's people. Those who are leaders, those who are teachers, they will receive the greater judgment. I believe it's Peter that says that. And so we do want to ask for that extra help because it truly is needed. Let's go to Matthew 19. Matthew 19. In Matthew 19, it says, Little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed from there. The church of God imitates Jesus in this manner. Now the practices at the Feast of Tabernacles for babies or very small children who can be picked up and held, we do ask angelic protection and blessings. And when I've been asked to give a blessing on these people, I tried to give this very same blessing that I ask God for my own children. And I've been in situations where, you know, sometimes people, they come into God's church and they have some children who are maybe even a little bit older. I mean, you can't pick them up. You know, they're maybe 
six or seven years old, and I've even placed my hands upon these young children uh, when they first come into contact with God's church because we do want God's protection for them. We want God's blessings in every way that they might grow up strong and healthy and intelligent, good-natured and good-looking, good-humored, obedient to God, obedient to their parents as they follow God. So we want that real blessing upon all of our children in God's church. And it's passed through the laying on of hands, picking up the children. Now the act of introducing ourselves to new people helps build closeness and can allow relationships to bud, which will pass blessings of friendship and mutual support. So I want to encourage all of us to be a committee of one, to ensure that no one feels alone in our congregation. No one should feel isolated among groups of people who already know each other. The blessings of human closeness and the right hand of fellowship should be evident in our congregation. Let's talk now about the fifth use of the laying on of hands. Submission to the government of God. And I have to say right at the beginning, this does not mean that you must obey every command of human ministers. Ministers can make mistakes. Ministers can get off track. But the ministry is to be helpers of our joy, not sheriffs of our salvation. The ministry does have legitimate authority to do certain things like organize when and where we meet, to make judgments on biblical issues. The Bible doesn't, for instance, the Bible doesn't define what increase is. And so when you're trying to figure your tithe, the, uh, the church should make a judgment what is equitable in the circumstances so you know what your increase is, then you can figure your tithe. So the, the church has to make judgments like that. The ministry is to feed the flock. And normally we understand that means ensure the members are fed with sound doctrine. But also, as much as practical, ensure their physical needs are supplied as well. Remember when there was a famine, a drought and a famine on the churches in Judea? What did Paul do? He sent to the churches in Corinth and in Achaia, and he made a collection, a collection of food that would help bring food for the poor saints that were in Judea. And so we also should try to be our very best to make sure that everyone's uh, needs are met. And of course, there are many government programs so we need to you know, direct people there first because we will all pay taxes to support those programs. But sometimes people fall through the cracks and we need to be ready to give alms and be helping for others when there is a need. So this submission to the government of God or submitting under the hand means to come under the authority of someone else. And I know it's a very sensitive subject in America today, but it is part of uh, what the Bible talks about in the laying on of hands. Let's go back to Genesis 16 and verse 9. We have an interesting situation here. Genesis 16 and verse 9. Well, I'll, I'll start a little bit for, uh, up a little bit before that. The situation was Sarah couldn't have children. And so after waiting for years, Sarah suggested that Abraham should uh, have a relationship with Hagar and have a child by her. And that was an acceptable practice in that society in that time. It's certainly not acceptable in our day and age at all. So Hagar conceived, in verse 4, and when she conceived, Sarah despised her. Or, excuse me, her mistress. So Hagar despised Sarah. And Sarah said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my might unto your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. Abram said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur, and he said, Hagar, sorry is made, where have you come from? Where are you going? She says, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. And the angel of the Lord said, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so they shall not be counted for multitude. And so then he gives this blessing. So in this situation, God informed Hagar she should go back and submit under the authority of Sarah, who was very imperfect 
very imperfect. But again, it seems like this had been provoked by Hagar's reaction once she knew she was pregnant and she despised her mistress Sarah. So they had to work things out. But Sarah was the one who had the authority over her. Now let's go to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13. This is a, I guess, perhaps it's sometimes a difficult scripture. Hebrews 13, verse 17. I'll read it in the New King James and then in the NIV. Hebrews 13, verse 7. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Well, that, that can raise hackles. You know, who's going to rule over me? You know, well, in NIV, it says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. And again, leadership in the church has certain proper authority. So follow the leaders in the church over the things that they have rightly the authority to decide. So again, this is something that we have to be careful of and to follow what the Bible teaches us. Back in 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, in verse 5, it says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. They may exalt you in due time, casting all of your care upon him, for he cares for you. Yes, so in God's way of looking at things, we are all to be humble, submissive to one another, working to maintain peace, working together for the good of the congregation, and have that humility, and yes, be subject to the elders in areas that they definitely have authority uh, to, to do and to administer. Let's talk now about the sixth area of laying on of hands, setting apart a sacrifice or signing guilt. We can go back to Leviticus chapter 1. Leviticus chapter 1. And verse 3. Leviticus chapter 1 verse 3. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish, he shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. Then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. So it's interesting. The person bringing the offering actually placed their hand on the animal and then participated in making the sacrifice. He shall kill the bull before the Lord. So it wasn't that they just sort of, you know, sent the bull ahead of time and the priest did all the work. No, the, the person who brought it had to lay their hands on it. It was symbolically transferring sin, transferring guilt. We see this also in chapter 3, verse 2, a peace offering. He shall lay his hand on the head of the offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle. Chapter 4, verse 4, he shall bring the bull to the door of the tabernacle, the meeting for the Lord, lay his hand on the bull's head and kill the bull before the Lord. So again, it was laying on of hand, is this setting a part of a sacrifice and assigning guilt to that animal. We see in Leviticus 16, something we read every year in the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16 and verse 21, it said, Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, this was the Azazel goat, and confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all of their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to an inhabit uninhabited land, and shall release the goat in the wilderness. We understand this is symbolic, a prophecy of Satan the devil. Satan is the liar. He's the, the original sinner. He's a murderer from the beginning. And God's going to place the responsibility for all sin back on the head of Satan the devil. And then, from what we understand, he will be sent away 
into outer darkness to wander forever far from the presence of God, far from the presence of light. One other thing in Leviticus 24, Leviticus 24, we had the sad situation of a person who was blaspheming an Israelite woman's son, blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed, Leviticus 24, 11, and they brought him to Lord, but uh, they brought him to Moses. Verse 12, they put him in custody that the mind of the Lord might be shown to them. And the Lord said to Moses, saying, take outside the camp him who has cursed, now that all who heard him lay their hands on his head and let all the congregation stone him. So this is where the witnesses had to be the ones who said, yes, I heard him curse, and they laid their hands, and that indicated he was the one, he was guilty, that guilt was there, and then he was stoned. So let's summarize. God is creating a thriving spiritual family, and he wants us all to be close to one another now and forever. We teach the importance, yes, the necessity of physically healthy members assembling and worshiping together with singing on God's Sabbath day. If we are close enough to touch one another, I think we're pretty close physically. Clearly, touching, contact, hugs must be appropriate to the sex, age, and relationship of the parties. Men especially need to be careful in any physical contact with the opposite sex that the contact is appropriate and wanted. We need to be sensitive to cultural differences and personal preferences. Some people will just not want to be hugged or to hug others. Some will only want to shake hands. Still, by understanding the doctrine of the laying on of hands, we see that God does want his people to know that they are loved, to thrive, and feel the closeness of being part of a happy family. The laying on of hands is used to impart divine healing through God's chosen servants, to give the gift of the Holy Spirit after baptism of a repentant believer, to ordain persons to various functions, roles, or offices in the church, to confer or pass on blessings, to signify submission to the authority or government of God in the church for those issues over which the church has legitimate authority, and to set apart a sacrifice or a guilty party prior to carrying out the sentence. So as we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, and remember God has chosen each one of us individually. He loves each one of us individually. And his hand is molding and shaping and blessing us and encouraging us and leading us in the path that we should go. As we humble ourselves under the mighty hands of God and Jesus Christ, who is also our loving husband for all eternity, when we drink in and learn to use the power, love, and sound mind imparted by the Holy Spirit, we are growing in vital qualities of character and love that will serve us well and help us live happily in peace and with great accomplishments forever. The doctrine of the laying on of hands is important to our growing in godly love and congregational closeness in our current life as spirit-begotten Christians and to our future role as spirit-born royal priests in the soon coming kingdom of God in the millennium.